Now today we uh, continue the discussion further on the law of the sea. Now we take up the developments that have taken place after the Geneva Convention of 1958. I just intend to speak to you, there were lots and lots of developments which have taken. The first important development happened to be the advancement of science and technology. In the area of science and technology, some of the states like Germany, Japan, as well as the state of the United States developed certain equipments which would be good enough to explore and exploit the mineral resources which are found in the seabed and subsoil. And they would be in a position to explore and exploit oil resources as well. In situations like this, it was a warning bell for the developing countries. The developing countries naturally felt that if these countries are allowed to do this, they are left with nothing. In a situation of this type, they wanted to have a discussion of these issues before the General Assembly of the United Nations. Now, the second major important development happened to be uh, in the year 1963. It was in the year 1963, the Moscow Nuclear Test Ban Treaty was adopted. Now, the, uh, the Moscow Nuclear Test Ban Treaty of 1963 of August 5th both prohibited and prevented the use of nuclear weapons or its explosion both underwater as well as airspace. Now there was an apprehension of fear or a threat that the states who are nuclear powers will be in a position to use it. And if they use it again, there will be a repetition of the devastation that has taken place during the course of the Second World War. And if this were to take place, there will be annihilation complete destruction of humanity. So, in order to prevent that for the first time, the international community was able to adopt the Moscow Nuclear Test Ban Treaty of August 5th, 1963. Then came, in 1960 itself, there were certain nuclear carriers. And these nuclear carriers may, were carrying nuclear material in the sh nuclear ships. And when they were transported, if some uh, mistake or if some leakage or some devastation were to take place, what is the kind of liability that should be put? Now, first and foremost, they would say the operator of the vessel was made completely liable in situations like this. And if the operator is not in a position to make good the compensation, the concerned state which is facilitated the whole episode should be answerable and provide compensation was the message that was conveyed in these conventions. However, in 1969, a convention was adopted. It was called the Brussels Convention. And in 1973, another convention was signed, which was called as the London Convention. Now, this is naturally to deal with the liability uh, of operators of, or, or naturally operators of, or carriers of oil. Now, suppose, for example, in a ship which is loaded with oil, million tons and tons of oil which it takes its voyage in the sea and afterwards it releases the voyage because of a wreck. In situations of this type, what would be the kind of compensation? Now they went to the insistent of pointing out, in all cases the concerned ship, uh, a oil tanker which is transporting the oil from one country to another and while making use of the uh, high seas or the territorial waters in the event of a damage must take insurance. Without insurance, it is not supposed to sail. And at least there was some hope that the, the concerned state which has suffered the damage will be in a position to get some kind of compensation. That is why these were insisted. Now, another important uh, point that is being mentioned is always remember in instance of this type, the a operator of the vessel was made responsible. And operator of the vessel, when I speak about it, his nationality of registration. Under no circumstances, the concerned ship which was responsible in causing the damage should be let free. That was the message that was conveyed in, uh, in these conventions. Then we come to a, an important development. The important development happened to be the a case that came up before the International Court of Justice. 
and this case is popularly known as the north sea continental shelf cases now before the discussing the north sea continental shelf cases i just intend to speak to you something relating to the continental shelf shelf itself now the continental shelf actually is the natural prolongation of the land territory in the seabed and subsoil so it is nothing but the natural extension of the land mass in the seabed and subsoil now when we speak about this in the natural extension of the land mass simply meant there will be what we call as the sedimentary culture now this sedimentary culture which is the culture of the mud as well as the rock which is extended even in the ocean so that is why the uh, geneva convention of 1958 pointed out that the coastal state is empowered to have a continental shelf itself now this continental shelf is extended up to an area of 200 nautical miles and in this 200 nautical miles the concerned coastal state is is allowed to remember to dig the mineral resources for itself and by itself so a sovereign right was actually given to the coastal state to take the mineral resources which is found within the continental shelf now if this is something relating to the continental shelf now there were issues relating to what we call as the the opposite states now for example you take the instance of the state of sri lanka as well as india now they are opposite states where there are opposite states how do you measure the continental shelf was the point that came before uh, the while making the convention of 1958 so under the geneva convention on continental shelf they pointed out where there are opposite states first and foremost you have to draw a baseline either a baseline or a low water mark and inward side of the shore it is called as the what we call as internal waters the area which is outside is called as the territorial sea now suppose for example Uh, between india as well as sri lanka at one point the distance is about 22 kilometers now at that time the convention says the where the continental shelf are opposite states the continental shelf must be divided by taking into consideration the equidistance method when i speak about the equidistance method it is 50 50 percent share so if there are 22 kilometers remember 1 kilometer will go for a purpose of measuring the internal waters because the water will recede to the lowest on a particular day from that point it is being measured so naturally 1 km if it goes 2 km from the other side state of sri lanka allo will go so both of them will be able to get 10 km each so that will be the dividing line equidistance line now a problem came up between the state of the federal republic of germany and denmark and federal republic of germany as well as the state of netherlands that is holland now you take into consideration the north sea itself the north sea actually is in concave shape and the north sea when it is in concave shape these are the states netherlands federal republic of germany as well as denmark are the adjacent states so these are the adjacent states in a concave shape what we call as shaped north, uh, north sea now what has happened was the morphologists as well as the geologists and the scientists pointed out for the state of germany as well as for the state of denmark and netherlands that in the north sea there is what we call as oil when there are plenty of resources which are beneath the seabed and so soil the state of germany as well as the state of denmark and the netherlands equally wanted to remember exploit these resources now in order to exploit these resources or before exploiting the resources the concerned state should have remember sovereignty and sovereign rights over the territory and how do you claim sovereign rights now both of them remember put out their maps and having put out their maps especially the state of germany pointed out the area in the north sea where oil is supposed to be there is an area which belong to germany then the state of denmark did not keep quiet 
It went to the eastern to pointing out the area which is wherein oil is supposed to be found is our territory. And similarly, the state of Netherlands also went to the extent of uh, pointing out the same. So there will be, remember, conflicting opinions and each of them try to claim the area as it is their, what we call as area and territory, wherein they are empowered to exercise jurisdiction. Now the Geneva Convention of 1958 pointed out, it is equidistance method, equally it has to be decided. Now in a situation of this type, how the when the continental shelf, when the coast is naturally in concave shape, how it can be applied, the equidistance method cannot be applied, was the main contention. Even if it is applied, the concerned parties will not be able to get their true original share. So in situations like this, what has happened was, the Federal Republic of Germany as well as the state of Denmark entered into an agreement in the year 1964. And another agreement that was entered between the state of Germany as well as the state of uh, Netherlands in 1965. And they referred the matter to the International Court of Justice for a judgment. How the continental shelf should be shared and how it should be measured. And what is indicated in Article 6, Paragraph 2 of the Geneva Convention of 1958 is valid or not was the point which they wanted to know from the International Court of Justice. Now, before the International Court of Justice, Germany pointed out, first and foremost, what is indicated in Article 6, Paragraph 2, that is measuring the, uh, the, the continental shelf by adopting the equidistance method cannot be accepted in this situation. It cannot be accepted in this situation for the simple reason Article 6.2, paragraph 2, Germany was, had only signed the convention but had not, uh, remember, ratified it. You participate in the conference and you have participated in the entire proceedings of the conference, conference but you have signed the convention but you have not ratified it. Since you have not ratified, Remember, it is not binding on Germany. Germany clearly said Article 6, paragraph 2, if the other states were to say, both the Denmark as well as the state of the, the Netherlands were to say, that is, it has become a customary rule of international law, we are not going to accept it. We are not going to accept it because we have only participated, but we have participated and signed, but we have not ratified and it is inapplicable. Now, the other states pointed out, Article 6, Paragraph 2 is the only principle that should be applied. And only when these principles are applied, there will be, everyone will be in a position to get its their due share. Now, the German contention was very simple. It went to the extent of pointing out, it is not, not only the principle of equity, but equitable principles. When I speak about equitable principles, remember, a larger share has to be given to the state of Germany. Now, the area of Germany is bigger than the area of Denmark. The area of Germany is bigger than the state of Netherlands. Population-wise, it is huge. Then, territory-wise, it is huge. There afterwards, remember, activities-wise, it is huge. And remember, com capability of controlling the territory, it is huge. So accordingly, he was saying it is not the principle of equity, but the equitable principles that are to be applied. Now, the International Court of Justice, having heard the argument, went to the extent of pointing out, under the existing rules of international law, under the Geneva Convention of 1958, Article 6, Paragraph 2, it simply points out that the measurement of the continental shelf of the countries will have to take place by adopting the equidistance method. And equidistance method as well as for purpose of sharing. First and foremost, the distance has to be shared before you take out the minerals. Then, if there is no other principle of law other than the equidistance, this is obligatory and everyone has to accept it. Having stated this, they pointed out, while measuring the territorial sea as well as the contiguous zone and the continental shelf, the especially relating to the continental shelf, 
the concerned parties should adopt equitable principles and the international court of justice agreed with the claim that was made by germany and with the result it was in a position to remember claim a larger area on equitable principles which was considered as just now one important aspect i wanted to tell you in this connection now germany when it uh, claimed equitable principles it is to claim remember the natural right of the state of germany not denying the remember the rights of others it was claiming the rights naturally because it is based on equitable principles now when equitable principles are applied suppose for example in the international court of justice in the judgment makes one statement while measuring the continental shelf of adjacent states each state or each party to the dispute should be in a position to get the area and the natural prolongation of the territory to itself that means what the natural prolongation of the land territory of a particular state naturally should go to it natural prolongation of the state of netherlands that is the sedimentary culture rock every etc etc naturally go to the state of netherlands similarly the natural prolongation of the land territory of the state of germany should go to it and so is the case with the state of denmark now then the second principle that was pointed out by the international court of justice is suppose for example certain areas overlap and certain areas overlap at that time they should come under naturally uh, they should enter into an agreement to remember take care of this area which is overlapping if no agreement is possible it should come under the supervision of a regime of joint jurisdiction so that means what first and foremost if certain areas overlap in situations of this type naturally this area should come under an agreement of all the three parties or two parties as the case may be and remember if no agreement is possible if no compromise is possible and first and foremost before the agreement before they enter into an agreement there shall be a compromise compromise if it is not possible then it should come under the regime of joint jurisdiction then while measuring the continental shelf of adjacent states the international court of justice in the north sea continental shelf cases 1969 pointed out first and foremost the configuration of the coast the general direction of the coast the depth of the coast and all other extra and extraneous factors are to be taken into consideration these factors are to be taken into consideration for the simple reason each state should be in a position to get the continental shelf which is the natural prolongation of that state should go to that state this was the judgment now remember this much this judgment was appreciated because for the first time the international court of justice applied the principle equitable principles i just told you when i spoke to you the customary international customs there was a decision which was delivered by the international court of justice uh, in the year 1937 diversion of water from the river meuse in the case relating to the diversion of water from the river meuse the international court of justice just pointed out that the anglo american equitable principle is a general principle of law recognized by civilized nations now what was stated by the international court of justice in 1937 remember had its echo in the decision of 1969 equitable principles and its recognition was done in this north sea continental full cases by the international court of justice now subsequent to that i just intend to make a mention to you there were several disputes which came between states and when several disputes that came between states for example between libya and malta between malta and tunisia and several other cases you can just refer to the uh, the the chart of the international court of justice you get to know these cases wherein remember the principle equitable principles was applied by the international court of justice this is a major development now another development that has taken place happened to be remember in the year 1971 the united nations has appointed a committee 
and in this this committee consisted of uh, remember 42 members and there later this committee was uh, the membership was enhanced to 84 now the very purpose of telling this is now there was some kind of fear that the nuclear power nations wanted to keep the emplacement of nuclear weapons on what we call as the seabed and subsoil when some of them must have thought of it and the international community took it very seriously and in 1971 the seabed and the arms control treaty came to in vogue now before it came to vogue richard nixon who was the president of the state of united states in the 1970s made a declaration that he in one of his state papers pointed out under the existing rules of international law the entire convention of the law of the sea has to be reviewed the geneva convention is totally inadequate and it has to be updated it is not in a position to tackle the existing challenges and the new challenges and the new discoveries which mankind have made on the area of law of the sea with the result it has to be reviewed was the expression of hugo gross uh, 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 richard nixon now there afterwards when the emplacement of nuclear weapons what we call as the uh, uh, arms treaty to see bed and arms control treaty when it was established members international community had to act with the caution and when they had to act with the caution naturally most of the members international community were calling for what we call as a third conference on the law of the sea the second one had taken place in the year 1960 it could not do anything the other day had just made a mention of it then they wanted to convene a third conference on the law of the sea Now the third conference of the law of the sea at the behest of the general assembly uh, was initiated and first conference it took place at new york and all the issues relating to the development which have taken place between 1958 to 1963 and thereafter were taken into consideration and remember the 1973 conference is generally known as the third conference of the law of the sea the third conference of the law of the sea remember had 12 sessions 12 sessions means remember 12 times the entire world community met and discussed and tackled and trashed out all the issues related to what we call as the law of the sea and afterwards in the year 1982 the convention of the law of the sea was signed on december 10th at montego bay in jamaica and the convention came into force in 1994 so it took 12 years for the entry into force of the convention of the law of the sea now i just intend to speak to you certain basic provisions of the convention of the law of the sea now when we take up the basic provisions of the law convention of the law of the sea first one is measurement of the territorial sea of a particular country and its width length now when we take up this matter for the first time under the convention of right, right from article 2 itself you get to know what we call as the territorial sea and its measurement the territorial sea of a particular state is measured either by adopting the low water mark or by adopting the baseline so it was very clear either by adopting the low water mark when i speak about the low water mark on a particular day the water recedes to the lowest on the coast of the sea and that point had to be taken into consideration so where the coast is deeply indented and curvature in form as i mentioned to you uh, in the anglo norwegian ca- um, case it should be the box method you can select certain points and having selected these points you join these points maybe islands maybe rocks maybe fjords and then the area outside the the waters is called as the territorial sea and it is up to a distance of 12 nautical miles now when i speak about this the area outside the coastal state up to a distance of 12 miles is the territorial sea of the concerned state then what is or what are the waters which are inward side of the shore the waters which are inward of the inward side of the shore are called as the in, internal waters and in internal waters the concerned state the littoral state is empowered to exercise absolute sovereignty 
because it is in internal waters generally harbors road steads ports all of them come under the internal waters of a particular state so in the internal waters naturally the kind of exercise the kind of sovereignty which is being exercised by a particular state over land can be exercised there now in the territorial sea first and foremost in the 12 nautical mile zone freedom of passage must be given to ships all ships of all nations by the coastal state now when i speak about the freedom of passage to ships of all nations freedom of passage is always innocent suppose for example a particular ship a foreign ship comes into the territorial sea and carries on an electronic intelligence operations now if it were to carry on electronic intelligence operations the concerned ship will be made to leave immediately and if the ship remember refuses to leave then comes what we call as the doctrine of hot pursuit it will come into force now the point at issue is freedom of passage to ships of all nations are given even for warship remember freedom of passage has to be given and freedom of passage is only remember innocent and suppose even the warship if you have to dive in the while passing through the coastal waters if it does something or destroys the some object which is found in the coastal state naturally it will be liable and answerable and compensation can be claimed now when we speak about the other important thing is in the territorial waters about jurisdiction to what extent the coastal state is empowered to exercise jurisdiction over the territorial waters first and foremost the coastal state is empowered to exercise jurisdiction especially in criminal matters now when i speak about criminal matters suppose for example a crime is taking place when the ship passes through the coastal waters of a particular country take it this way a foreign ship passes through the territorial waters of the state of india that is within 12 nautical miles and then can the government of india or the can the coastal guards or the can the naval guards exercise jurisdiction on such persons first and foremost under the convention of the law of the sea there are remember uh, provisions which are being indicated now these provisions point out if the consequences of the crime perpetrated within the vessel extend to the coastal state this is one if the consequences of the crime perpetrated within the vessel extend to the coastal state then the second one is if a request is specially made by the captain of the vessel or the consular general or the ambassador or the concerned uh, uh, ship or the ship state suppose for example the ship is a british ship and if it is a british ship the captain of the british ship or the consular general of the state of great britain or the ambassador or the high commissioner there for the commonwealth countries rick makes a request then the coastal guards of the state of india or the military of the state of india naval forces can interfere now the third thing that is being spoken is if the very act that is being perpetrated within the vessel is going to disturb the peace security interest and good order of the concerned state so if it were to disturb the peace security interest and good order of the concerned state the coastal state naturally will intervene now the fourth one or the is most important that is now if it is necessary for the suppression of narcotic drugs suppose for example the coastal state has the reason to believe that the concerned vessel which is which passes through its coastal waters is carrying narcotic drugs and in the event of such suspicion naturally the coastal guards of the concerned state can visit and search the vessel this is being permitted otherwise the passage is free now you may be interested to know can what type of civil jurisdiction is being exercised civil jurisdiction for all purposes only if there is a, a a case against the vessel and if the vessel only is required then they can seize the vessel otherwise for all purposes the passage is free it is empowered to move within the 12 mile territorial zone 
And when I speak about this, I just spoke to you, territorial sea. But what about the subjacent airspace? The airspace about the 12 nautical miles also belongs to the concerned space. And the concerned state is empowered to exercise jurisdiction, not only on the surface water, but even above what we call as the upper, uh, upper strata, superjacent airspace. Now, having spoken something relating to the territorial sea and its measurement, internal waters, territorial waters, we go to another area which is known as the contiguous zone. Now, what do you mean by contiguous zone? Contiguous zone simply means a zone which is adjacent to the territorial sea. That is why it is contiguous. The area outside the territorial sea or the area which is adjacent to the territorial sea up to a distance of 12 nautical miles is called as the contiguous zone. Now, contiguous zone is very much essential for a particular state. Now, here the coastal state under the Convention of the Law of the Sea of 1982 is empowered to exercise some kind of jurisdiction on physical, immigration, sanitary and customs. Now, what do you mean by physical? Physical means relating to money, duty. Now, suppose for example, certain ships come there and having uh, gone to the, uh, within the 24 nautical mile zones, they try to bring some what we call as foreign aliens and dump them. You might be knowing, see, some aliens are found uh, in the Adriatic. They were supposed to go to somewhere in some state, for example, Netherlands or Greece or some other countries and European countries and they are caught. Now, in circumstances such as this, if they are found within the 24 nautical mile zones, they are empowered to exercise jurisdiction. The other one is sanitary. The coastal zone has to be kept clean and it should not become in a polluted area. Suppose a foreign vessel, when it, go, when it is taking its voyage beyond the 12 nautical miles, if it, remember, pollutes naturally, there will be sanitary powers which is being given to the coastal state. It is empowered to exercise jurisdiction. So, customs, suppose for example, you must have heard from Dubai, lots of gold and other things, smuggling items take place. And remember, within the 24 miles, the ship comes up to that or the boat comes up till there and then it is being put on another Indian boat. And this is, neither the governments get the tax for this purpose and it is like all, all kinds of activities take place there. And in order to prevent that, the customs authorities can keep a watch on the coastal side, uh, what we call as the, the contiguous zone. So, three, four kinds of jurisdiction. It may be physical, financial matters relating to, then customs, sanitary, physical. All of them, the concerned state is empowered to do. And beyond this, we have to think about the other, other zone, which is called as the uh, exclusive economic zone. Exclusive economic zone, if you uh, take into consideration from the territorial waters, beginning of the territorial waters, it is up to 200 nautical miles, it is called as the EEZ, exclusive economic zone. Now, in the exclusive economic zone of a particular state, what type of rights you have? Now, first and foremost, the coastal state has sovereign rights, remember, but not sovereignty. It has sovereign rights. You may say, why sovereign rights? Because it is empowered to explore and exploit the resources which are found in the seabed and subsoil. So, it is in a position to explore and exploit the resources which are found in the seabed and subsoil. That is why it is sovereign rights that is being given, not sovereignty. Now, thereafterwards, remember, it is empowered to control what we call as the navigation. And when it is empowered to control the navigation, the same analogy is applicable. Now, when the same analogy is applicable, take it this way, a particular vessel of a foreign country comes to the economic zone. If it is 200 miles, uh, it is somewhere in the 150th mile. Having come there, it tries to carry on fishing activities without the knowledge of the littoral or the coastal state. So, at that time, uh, the what we call as the doctrine of hot pursuit come into the uh, fore. Now, the doctrine of hot pursuit has one or two important major principles, which I shall explain. Now, I speak about the doctrine of hot pursuit. First is, 
if a foreign vessel enters to the coastal waters of a particular country having entered the coastal waters of a particular country it flouts or violates the local laws made by that state at that time the concerned vessel may be asked to leave from that area and remember and if it refuses to leave then what what is known as the doctrine of hot pursuit begins so it can be the concerned ship can be chased when i speak about chasing of a foreign ship remember when once the chase starts it just starts continuously and uninterruptedly when once you start a chase of a particular ship it should begin from your zone from your territory from your waters and then the chase starts and the chase remember continuous and uninterrupted and the chase will come to an end only when the concerned ship or the vessel enters into either its own territorial waters or to the territorial waters of some other state and there you cannot do that because you will be chased back and remember always the chase when it is done it has to be done through public vessels that means governed and state owned government vessels generally it is done by the naval vessels only coast guard vessels only it cannot be done through by private vessels but for a purpose of inter- interpretation a private vessel which is hired for public purpose can also also be used provided there should be authentic certificate to that effect that the government has hired a per- private vessel for a public purpose this is called generally as the doctrine of hot pursuit now the other important thing is for example you must have uh, seen the pictures heard about it must have read about it the exploration and exploitation of oil which is taking place in uh, visakhapatnam in bombay high now most of these activities take place within the 100 mile or 115 mile zone within the economic zone now when this is being done whether it is allowed to be done the answer is yes but then when exploitation takes place there in such areas the concerned state the littoral state naturally has to put a fortification and a fortification has to be put because not only fortification has to be done it has to be <coughs> signaled through lights lights are to be put during night time so that a foreign navigating vessel is not supposed to go to the spot and disturb the concerned area now this is the most important thing and if that is done again the concerned person the state or the ship which has done is entitled to be uh, seized and captured that is the answer that is being spoken so first is the coastal state in its economic zone is empowered to construct an artificial island and when it constructs an artificial island within the 500 meters depth there should be a fence that has to be put when it has when it puts the fence naturally it is for its own security and it should not be disturbed and during the time of navigation any foreign ship is supposed to navigating is supposed to respect this zone the coastal state is entitled inter- empowered to entitled to fishing rights naturally it is it can take the entire fish which is bound Uh, living resources which is found in its coastal waters that is within the exclusive economic zone if it is interested to share a bit of it to other states naturally it is empowered to do it provided there is an agreement to that effect a foreign vessel having entered there remember is not supposed to pollute it and if it pollutes it it will be asked to leave and if it doesn't leave the doctrine of hot pursuit comes into the picture criminal jurisdiction remember naturally can be exercised on the lines which i have just mentioned to you now these are and the space above what we call as the super adjacent air space within the 200 nautical miles the coastal state is supposed to the total state is supposed to enjoy these are certain things which are being spoken about the in the exclusive economic zone now there afterwards we go to discuss something related to what we call as the high seas When I speak about the high seas, high seas, as Hugo Grotius has pointed out, belongs to none. It belongs to all. Since it belongs to none, it belongs to all. That is where Arvid Pardo 
a great scholar from Malta pointed out it is the common heritage of mankind. The Convention of the Law of the Sea of 1982 also has made use of it. The high seas is the area, this is called as the area which is beyond, remember, state limit is called as the common heritage of mankind. And this area belongs to all. When I speak about belongs to all, it has to be used by everyone. But then nobody is supposed to claim sovereignty over the high seas. It is not, remember, capable of occupation. High seas is not the subject of occupation. No state can ever think of occupying a bit or a portion of the high seas beyond the national jurisdiction. And remember, exploration and exploitation cannot be done. It can be, if at all it can be done, it has to be under the, the, under the offices which are created under the United Nations system with the consent of all. You have what we call as the International Seabed Authority. International Seabed Authority is essentially created for this purpose. Now this is what it is indicated. Now when I speak about the, uh, the high seas, there are as many as five to six freedoms which are given to a state. Now what, what are these five to six freedoms which are indicated under Article 87 of the Convention of the Law of the Sea? Now the first freedom is the freedom of navigation. Freedom of navigation is given to every state. Now the second freedom is freedom of overflight. It means what? Any, any aircraft belonging to any nation is empowered to make use of the high seas above, that is above the upper strata of the atmosphere. So, subjacent airspeed can be made use of for purpose of overflight. Any flight, you naturally, even a jet or a private flight can also go, nothing, no harm done. So, freedom to fly above the high seas is a basic right. Now the third freedom that is being put is the freedom to put submarine cables in the high seas. Well, earlier most of, the, most of the communications used to take place, remember, because of the submarine cables. Now all of them are being shifted to satellites. But even then there are certain states wherein they put submarine uh, cables. Submarine cables naturally, remember, is in the high seas and it cannot be interfered with by any state. It is a freedom that is being recognized under the Convention of the Law of the Sea. Now the other right that is being said is, indicated is oil pipelines. Oil pipelines of a particular state can be put in the seabed and subsoil. Nobody can disturb about it. There cannot be. And if anybody disturbs, remember there will be liability. Then the other one is for purpose of scientific research. Each state has the power and the ability to carry on scientific research. And the freedom of navigation is applicable not only to a particular state which has a coast, but even to landlocked states. All states under the present day international law are entitled and empowered to make use of the high seas. That is why it is the common heritage of mankind. Since it is the com common heritage of mankind, no state can think of or attempt to emplace a nuclear weapon or weapon of mass destruction on the high seas. No state is supposed to indulge, remember, in polluting the high seas. It is not allowed. No state is allowed to facilitate certain objects which are against the provisions of the Convention of the Law of the Sea. Then we come to what we call as piracy. Piracy, piracy is an illegal act of detention, depredation and violence that is perpetrated against a ship. Now this, the moment is being perpetrated, it is considered as a piratical act. Piracy is a universal crime today and the people who commit piracy are, uh, remember, international criminals and they lose the protection of their home state. And even their home state, the nationality of the concerned state which has given the nationality need not come to protect them. Now, what is the difference between piracy and the hijacking? Now, hijacking is an act that is taking place within the aircraft. But piracy is an, an act which is committed against the vessel. When piracy is committed, an act which is committed against the vessel, it is called as piracy. And remember, suppose for example, uh, 
generally uh, piracy is committed by private vessels. And can a public vessel commit piratical acts? Suppose for example, there is a public vessel. And can this, the public vessel and the crew will be in a position to commit an act of piracy? Now the point at issue is, suppose for example, if the crew of a public vessel become mutinous, if they mutiny against the concerned state, and afterwards they try to take over the vessel, in such circumstances, it will be considered as an act of piracy. So, under the existing rules of international law, piracy is a universal crime. So, any illegal act of violence, detention, depredation, committed for private ends under the Convention of the Law of the Sea is what we call as privacy. It's an act of privacy. It is condemned and for condemned forthwith. Now, having discussed this much, we go to what we call as the continental shelf. What exactly are the provisions relating to continental shelf and how these provisions are being applied under the present day international law? Now, when I speak of a continental shelf, naturally, it is nothing but the natural prolongation of the land territory beneath the seabed, seabed and up subsoil. Some writers go to the extent of pointing out it is nothing but the ocean floor. And in the ocean floor, remember, you have what we call the submerged seabed and subsoil. And you have the continental platform. And you have the ab abysmal sea, sea later. So there will be, the first and foremost, there will be continental shelf, there will be, the, there will be a steep, continental steep. And then what we call as continental rise. Then the abysmal plain. Now all these things are being spoken. Our purpose is to know only. The coastal state is empowered to uh, enjoy, exploit, explore and take away the resources both living and non-living wherever it is which is found in the zone which is called as the continental shelf which is 200 nautical miles. So up to a distance of 200 nautical miles a state is empowered to explore and exploit the non-living resources mainly of the seabed and subsoil. And as I just I told you, even on the surface water, if artificial islands are constructed while exploring and exploiting, it has to be, remember, uh, safeguarded by it and it has to be protected and it should not be harmed by the navigating vessels as well. This is the fundamental point. Now, for, for example, in the, this is something relating to continental shelf and the cases I had just mentioned to you. Then further we go to uh, discuss something relating to the resources which are found in the high seas. There was a lot of questions, lot of questions which came in before the, the, when the convention was drafted. Now the, some of the states said, why can't we explore and exploit the resources which are found in the high seas? But then if it is allowed to be done by a particular state without monitoring, naturally, it will take off the entire resources for itself and become rich. That has to be controlled and regulated. That is where the, the Convention of the Law of the Sea has created a body which is known as the International Seabed Authority. Now, International Seabed Authority is only empowered to look into the seabed and the subsoil, what we call as the area the submerged area, subbed and subsoil, to be taken into consideration and supervised by it. So the International Seabed Authority has an assembly, wherein you have all members. And then you have what we call as the executive committee, which is composed of 36 members. Then you have a secretariat. So the assembly, the executive body, that is called the Seabed Council, which has 36 members, and then the most important in the office of secretariat naturally uh, looks after the International Seabed Authority. Now when I speak about this, the International Seabed Authority itself have what we call as their list of pioneer investors. And these pioneer investors, they explore and exploit at the behest of the International Seabed Authority. Now the purpose is whatever being exploited has to be exploited under the supervision and guidance of the International Seabed Authority. Now naturally the profits will have to go and the profits ultimately will be shared by each contenders and each states. That is why the International Seabed Authority came in. 
Now there were some others, pioneer investors, private investors, all of them are being taken care and looked after under the rules and regulations which are formed by the International Seaport Authority. Now suppose for example in the event of a dispute, what shall be done? For purpose of res resolving the dispute for the first time, under the convention they established what we call as the law of the sea tribunal. The law of the sea tribunal which is established is a tribunal, a judicial body created only for settling the disputes between states relating to their resources or the disputes under a particular treaty. Now this is the, the law of the sea tribunal is situated in Hamburg in Germany. Now we, when we go further, there are other conventions which are being mentioned as well. This is convention relating to the marine protection uh, of the marine resources. Now when I speak about conservation is very much essential. It is essential not only for states, it is essential for the entire international community. When a particular state exploits the resources naturally, it should take care of conserving the resources as well. And if the resources are cons not conserved, it will deplete. And depletion will lead to extinction. And if it's, without which, remember, no man, international community can survive. For example, take it away, there are uh, fishery varieties. We have Solomon, we have Adhok and other things. Suppose because you have the, the technology, huge technology, can you completely exploit the fishery resources and exhaust everything and leave nothing for the future generation? That is why all these conventions for the living resources, protection of the living resources indicate when a particular state exploits, naturally it should facilitate conservation as well how it should be done. And they can get the best of assistance and help even from, from food and or agricultural organization as well. The same analogy is applicable even to what we call as the area which is beyond the national jurisdiction, that is the high seas. By taking all these factors, remember, the very purpose of doing this is to say that the people in the world should satisfy and live safely. And there cannot be any kind of pollution. That is where weapon of mass destruction cannot be taken there and be kept and exploded. All these principles have been spoken and this in general is nothing but some of the major area or the major points under the Convention of the Law of the Sea. Thank you.